go. All right, good morning. Um, we'll get started uh, then with um, just a, just the overview for uh, today and some starting um, comments. So um, I just want to uh, remind you that um, the, uh, the reflections at the end of the week are really important for me to, to figure out what's going on in the class, but also um, they're, I think they're important for you as a reflection. In addition, um, they're worth 15% of your grade. So, um, and I know this section is gonna have more questions than, than obvious uh, applications, but, uh, or this last section, but I think we're, we're moving on to now the point where we can start applying that. And that's kind of where we're headed for today. Um, so please make sure you do that. Um, I'll have the homework finished today. I apologize, it's been um, longer than I would have liked. Um, it's just uh, me trying to figure out how best to handle uh, putting comments on scan stuff and rescanning it or um, or whatever. So, anybody have any questions about that or issues? Okay, um, okay so today we're going to finish up uh, complex analysis and um, we're going to take a, a bit of a step back. Uh, for calculating residues, since that was a, a bit of a question in um, some of the reflections, and then um, basically apply uh, the residue theorem, use what's called the Cauchy principal value, and uh, use that to um, basically integrate interesting um, intervals and intervals that, that we often see, or types of intervals that we often see in physics. Um, so wherever we land at the end of that, I've got one kind of lengthy, well, not lengthy, but weird example at the end that I'm kind of debating about whether I'm going to do now or save for later it involves green functions, um, which we will deal with eventually, uh, but I don't want to be too confusing now. So having said all of that, um, I do want to remind you, and I did post two example videos that I hope you saw um, over the weekend in terms of how to do a contour interval and how to compute residues. And I did one case and then left you to do another case. Um, but one thing I wanna point out as you're busily, busily scribbling is that um, there are a number of ways that you can calculate uh, poles. What it comes down to, I mean, for me, the easiest way often is to use these two rules. One, uh, G.5 is for a simple pole, that is for a pole of order one. And then for higher order poles, um, you can use G.6. And if you think about the, um, if you had a chance to look at the example video that I posted, essentially what you do when, when you're trying to calculate uh, the residues, you, you identify um, where that pole is and you multiply Z minus that pole. Uh, times the function and then evaluate it at that function. Basically, you're removing that singularity and that gives you the residue. That comes from our, um, uh, essentially our Taylor expansion, our Laurent expansion. Um, when it's higher order, as we'll see in a minute, you might have to take a derivative to get, say, uh, the, uh, for a second order pole to get the res the residue for a second order pole, you take the first derivative of that function. Eval and now notice that this is a limit, right? So then you would take this function, um, take the derivative of that, and then evaluate it essentially at z equals zero, right? That is, as the limit of z goes to zero. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna scroll up slowly if everybody's ready. Yeah? All right, so I kind of hinted at the kinds of, um, okay, maybe you can hear Gooch snoring in the background. I can. Okay, Got to try scene, change of uh, scenery and that's what I get. Anyway, um, 
what we're going to do this morning is uh, look at different kinds of integrals that we can solve. And I, I started um, um, last time with one, just sort of hinting at it, and we'll finish it now. So in terms of different, definite integrals, we'll start with uh, an integral that is of the form 0 to 2 pi of a function that's a, essentially a trigonometric function that is What's our, the, the goal here is what's the standard, the standard uh, solution for functions that depend on sine and cosine. Okay, so uh, given that we're in the complex plane, we can choose to let z be equal to i to the theta, assuming that we're uh, using um, for the case, why is it going off? Okay, uh, for a unit circle, and that means that dz is equal to i e to the i theta d theta. Okay, so that gives us d theta is equal to minus i dz over z, and then sine theta is going to be z minus z to the minus one over two i, and cosine theta would be the usual z plus z minus one over two. Okay, nothing uh, extraordinary there. Uh, what that means then is that our interval i becomes minus i now times this contour, whatever contour that we're going to choose of this function that's now a function of z minus z minus one or to the minus one over two i and z plus z minus one over two times dc over z. Okay. So I just wanna make sure g7. All right, um, with the path in this case being uh, the unit circle. Okay, so this is uh, c such that z is less, well, z is equal to one unit circle. Um, and if this is the case, uh, then we know that from the uh, residue theorem that i is equal to minus i times 2 pi i times the sum of whatever the residues are. That is the residues that are enclosed, those singularities that are enclosed in our contour. Okay, so that's that G7a. All right, so what's left then is to define um, a function. So let's look at a function. Uh, and in this case, we will set i equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta over 1 plus epsilon cosine theta where epsilon is some number less than one. This allows us to basically use the, the essential manipulations of the, uh, that, that are, that's inherent to the residue theorem. Um, okay, so we can rewrite this as minus i times c such that z is equal to one, the unit circle. And now we replace everything so that this is dz, and we've got a z on the bottom, and then we have one plus epsilon over two times z plus z minus one. That's just going through that substitution, and if we continue that, uh, we get minus i two over epsilon times the uh, contour integral of dz over z squared plus 2 over epsilon z plus 1. Okay, so far that's just algebra and um, we would then, in order to find um, or do the next step, what do we need from this? In order to use the um, tools of complex analysis, what do we need to get out of this? A root step polynomial? So, okay. so we need, 
Exactly. Uh, Nick, sorry to cut you off. The, what we need are the roots. In other words, we need to find um, Z, we need to find those Z naughts, or Z1 or Z2. Um, so if we calculate uh, the roots just um, from a quadratic formula, uh, we have Z minus, which is equal to minus uh, one over epsilon minus one over epsilon times the square root of one minus epsilon squared, and Z plus, which is minus one over epsilon plus one over epsilon square root minus epsilon squared. Now, um, you should convince yourself that this root is inside and this root is outside the contour that we selected, right? So we want to focus on uh, Z plus, okay? If we were to look, if we were to focus our attention on Z minus, since it's outside the contour that doesn't give us anything, there aren't any residues to that. So we need to integrate this or evaluate this near the point Z equals Z plus. Um, so if we look just, if we focus on the denominator, oops, denominator, we have z squared plus two over epsilon z plus one, which we can uh, write out as an expansion. Basically, we can, essentially, we can tailor expand it. It's ultimately a Laurent uh, expansion if we, if we just keep it as a one over this term. And since this is gonna be evaluated at z plus, the first term is gonna be zero. So z is equal to z plus, plus z minus z plus times d dz of z squared plus two over epsilon z plus one evaluated at z plus. Another way of saying this is that we've discovered a second order pole. Okay, so um, when we do this, we get z minus z plus times 2z plus plus 2 over epsilon. Okay, this is for the denominator, right? So what is the residue at z plus then? I've written it this way to be a little bit tricky, I understand, but it's to point out something. What is, just in general, what is the, what's the definition without any equations of the residue? Is, is it kind of like the, the term before the pole in the series? It's well. You're you're right. You're almost there. It's it's the a sub minus one term, right? So wh whatever the order of the pole is, the a sub minus one term. Um, so if I've written it like this, what we're really talking about is uh, let me rewrite it a little bit. Two um, z plus plus two over epsilon times z minus z plus, right? So if we're expanding this as a function of z minus z plus, then all of this is the a minus one coefficient. That is, that's the coefficient that we multiply times z to the z minus z minus z plus to the minus one. Okay, everybody cool with that? So if you go back into some of the examples where we've expanded things out, the definition of the residue is a minus one, or a sub minus one, okay? So if that's the case, um, then, and remember that z plus is inside the contour, then i from the residue theorem is equal to minus i, uh, times two over epsilon 
times two pi i times one over two z plus two epsilon evaluated at z equals z plus, right? Where that is equal to the function evaluated at that uh, pole. Or in other words, this uh, integral is two pi over one minus epsilon squared. Okay, I wanna take a, a second uh, for you to look at that. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask before we go on. That top, top line of the screen, yes. where, where did that come from? Um, this is a basic, uh, where is it? This is a Taylor expansion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or essentially a Laurent expansion. What we're looking at, what, what's cutting this off, is that this is the actually the denominator, right? If we were on to do the Laurent expansion, we would do, it's essentially the, Taylor expansion of that. Okay. So, I mean, I, I kind of did this a little bit um, opaquely just to reinforce that the residue is the coefficient of the one over z to the minus one term. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, in, I'm going to skip over this one example that I had because I've done this before. So, um, just so I'm consistent here, this is A, sorry about scrolling, uh, B, uh, check the video, uh, on the, um, uh, on, uh, Moodle. That's an example of the case where you have an integral of, uh, f of say x dx, actually not a contour at this point, from minus infinity uh, to infinity, where um, you change this to a complex function that's analytic on the upper half plane okay, of the complex plane. And in the example that I did, um, Right, and on that video, we looked at a contour, basically, uh, where um, I think I was doing for this, uh, the interval minus infinity to infinity of dx over one plus x squared, right? Where we had one pole above here, i, and one pole down here, so we're, in closing that whole I. And um, in that video, you're able to show that this um, uh, interval is equal to pi. But I already did that on a, like a 10 minute video that's available. So you should look at that. Okay. All right. Um, whoa. Hey, come back. All right. C. Uh, let's consider integrals that are of the type integral from minus infinity to infinity, f of x e to the i a x. Let me get this out of the way here. Dx. Uh, in other words, integrals that are Fourier transforms. Right. So whether it was called this or not, you've seen this. Um, in quantum mechanics, if you took advanced mechanics, you might have seen it as well. Um, certainly, it's, it makes up a, almost, a, it, almost any field that we do in, in physics, but especially uh, quantum mechanics um, and, and mechanics. Um, what we're going to assume then is assume f of z is analytic except for uh, poles, again, in the upper half plane. Um, we can take the area of poles, and we'll see a case of this in the lower half plane, but that it all depends on whether the contour is going to blow up or not. Um, so it, it really depends on the, the type of the function that you're looking at. Um, and 
we're going to look at the case where the limit of f of z as z goes to infinity equals zero and consider values theta in zero and pi. Okay, in other words, when it comes to doing our contour, we're back to this kind of contour again. And um, we're assuming that there's going to be a pole inside that. Okay, but everywhere else it's analytic. The only difference between this and the previous class of examples is that we've got our function f of x, and now we have some kind of complex uh, argument as well. Okay. Um, so what we can do then is look at the integral on this semicircle, and that's equal to the integral from zero to pi of, now we're going to make this uh, replacement of r e to the i theta. Okay, so again, we're making this um, switch from x to z, and then we're identifying z by that exponential form that we did about a week ago. And this is where it gets a little hairy. Um, we have e to the i a, but now we have um, cosine theta minus a r sine theta, and then i r e to the i theta d theta. This is just expanding out that argument and recognizing that we can write z is a cosine uh, something plus, plus i sine something, right? So the i kind of carries through. Um, and this is g.8. Um, okay, so the, this looks like we haven't made any progress, uh, but what we're, we're going to do is let r be so large that f of z, the absolute value of f of z, the magnitude of that, which is the magnitude of this function. Again, this function that is inside uh, the integral multiplying that exponential is less than some other number epsilon, then we can write that E semi is less than or equal to, we start pulling out terms epsilon times R from zero to the integral from zero to pi of E to the minus A R sine theta D theta. Okay. Why did the cosine term disappear? Because it's an even function around this? Yeah, right. So we can, uh, we can focus on this sine function. Uh, we'll write this as g.9. And then um, the trick here, again, is we've done this a couple of times, uh, starting back uh, two weeks ago, with, and it's one of the reasons why we started with um, series, is to consider how we're going to bound this. If you think about our contour, Right, this is essentially our, our region is from zero uh, to pi. But if we think about uh, our sine, but for sine theta, right? Zero to pi halves is what encloses the, um, uh, the residue or encloses the, the pole. And further, if you think about, in order to make this uh, a reasonable um, uh, expression, if we had the line um, basically to theta over pi, that is theta is equal to pi halves and we have our, our sine of theta. On this interval, we can write that two theta over pi is always going to be less than or equal to sine theta. Now that 
may look confusing, but what that means is that the absolute value of this interval is less than or equal to two epsilon r times the interval from zero to pi halves of e to the minus a r two theta over pi d theta. In other words, we can replace that argument with this um, two theta over pi. So that means that this interval is less than two epsilon r. We can do this interval, right? So this is times one minus e to the minus a r over a r times two over pi. It's over pi. And then the, all that's left with this is now take the limit. So now we take the limit that r goes, uh, capital R, goes to infinity of this semi-hemispherical uh, or the semicircle integration that has to be less than pi over a epsilon. And since epsilon goes to zero as r goes to infinity, the limit of r goes to infinity of i semi is zero. And in fact, as your book says, I think this is so important, it, it requires um, a commemoration and this is known as Jordan's Lemma. Okay, so um, what we've done is just take a, basically a piece of uh, this uh, interval and shown that it's equal to zero. If we get to, and, and if we get to the general problem, what this gets us, this is 2.9, and an important result, which we'll use again. What this buys us is that when we look at any interval that we've stipulated is analytic on the upper half plane, has um, a finite number of poles uh, on that plane, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x times e to the i a x dx plus this r to the, as limit as r goes to infinity of this integral along the semicircle. That is, if we're integrating along that real line, that ends up being from uh, the residue theorem, just two pi i times the sum over the upper half plane of the residues. So this is a general result. What we basically have done is taken this kind of interval right here and said, all right, we're gonna break this up into essentially two contours. Contribution for this is gonna be zero as R goes to infinity. And then we're left with what we are trying to solve, which is the integration from minus infinity to infinity of this problem. Okay, so in other words, minus infinity to infinity of f of x e to the i a x dx is equal to two pi i upper half times the residues. Why is this important? Well, why is this important? Why? It's kind of a long way around, and I and I forgive you certainly if it didn't look like it was obvious. But what does this buy us? Why do we care? Remember the the guiding principle of my career. If it stands for nothing else, it's to be creatively lazy, right? Don't do more work than you have to do in physics. So what does this buy you? Keeps us from having to do really complicated yeah. integrals.
Right. Instead of doing this integral, all you have to do is identify the residues and add them up in the upper half plane. And that's true for anything, any function f of x that's analytic in the upper half plane times e to the ax. Right? So any interval, essentially, that you're going to run into, we can use this in order to evaluate as long. And of course, this is from minus infinity to infinity. But if it's uh, an even function, we can always take uh, twice the interval from 0 to infinity. OK, everybody cool with that? That is the real main idea of a lot of this, is that we're going to be looking at and crunching through these intervals. And it's not even algebra at this point, right? It's just addition. If we can identify the poles, or if we can identify the residues, then we're just adding them up in the contour. And then the question is, when do we see these intervals in physics? Well, we see the Fourier transform all the time, right? OK. Let you finish that. And then um, sort of the last section that I'm going to go over with complex analysis, um, it, and then we'll call it a day. I know that there's other things in here, branch points and things like that that I'm kind of skipping over. Branch points just deals with things that are multi-valued, especially the natural logarithm. Um, we can pretty much get away uh, without looking at that in detail. But what I really want to get to um, before we call it a day on this is the so-called Cauchy principle value. Okay, so um, CPV. When does the Cauchy principle value show up in complex analysis? From your excellent reading of this gripping, gripping textbook. It's so gripping, they keep adding authors after one of them dies. So just to tell you how old this is, when I took it, it was just Arfkin. Then they added Weber, then Weber died, then they added Harris. OK, what's one case where we've talked about um, poles that we haven't considered yet? We've, what are the two cases so far that we've considered when we've looked at poles? Either what or what? What does the residue theorem say? Point out what's the what's the difference? Where what's important about where a pole is? The order. The order, but where is it located? When we use the residue theorem, it's either where or where. Inside, inside or outside? There we go. It's either inside the contour or outside the contour. If it's inside the contour, then the contour is equal to 2 pi i times the, resi the sum of the residues. If it's outside the contour, the integral is equal to 0, right? If it's a closed path. And so far, that's all we've been considering is a closed path. So the Cauchy principle value is what hap occurs and what happens when you're, you have a pole on your contour. In other words, it's also a case in which your contour doesn't close back on itself. What do you do then? And is there any use to that? Well, it turns out, yes, there is. So um, let's suppose uh, that we have a pole on a contour. Um, and we can start with a simple example here. Let's put this as, um, say, x naught, and this is x and y. And we've decided to make our contour. Essentially, we were going to do this, right? Oh, no, we don't have any way of dealing with this, right? So um, one possibility, but wait. We're creative, and we're creatively lazy. So what we want to do instead is just bend this a little bit around. 
right? Uh, and if we do this, notice that when we uh, avoid, if, if we decide to avoid uh, that pole in this sense, this is counter, this is a counterclockwise, we call this C. C prime is clockwise, right? So we can also um, do the same thing. and preserve the sense. So this is counterclockwise and this is also counterclockwise, right? So in essence, what we're doing is deforming um, our contour. So uh, how we do this, let's let Z um, minus X naught be equal to some small uh, radius delta times E to the I phi uh, and DZ I don't know why I'm using phi. I tend to use phi and theta interchangeably. Sorry. Uh, that's because I'm using three different editions of this book. Harris. Yeah, you get it. Arfkin and Arfkin and Weber and Arfkin and Weber and Harris. So anyway, um, dz is equal to i delta e to the i phi d phi. And this should be g12. Okay, so the integral then uh, dz over z minus x naught is equal to minus i from pi to 2 pi. So we're going across uh, the, the x-axis, right? We're not going up. Um, of d phi is equal to i pi, which is equal to i pi times a sub minus 1. Notice that this is a very simple, when we do the Laurent exp expansion, there's only one term here, right? And it's the A minus one term, okay? Um, on the other hand, this is for counterclockwise, right? So this is when we uh, deform underneath it. For clockwise, we are looking at the integral from i to from pi to zero of the same thing, and that's equal to minus pi, i pi, or minus i pi a sub minus one. So these are g13 a and b. In other words, we count one half the residue if it's on the contour. Okay. So the question you might ask, and you should ask is, well, which one should we use, right? Does it make a difference? And the answer is no, it doesn't make a difference. And why doesn't it make a difference if we do a contour interval? Right, so, so far all we did was just this piece, right? Or just this piece. So why doesn't it matter for a contour interval? Is that make a half a zero if it's outside? Say, say that again? If it's outside the contour, then it's zero. So the other right. half is zero. Right. So, um, and your book uh, does a pretty good um, job of this. If you consider f of z, and you consider your choices of going either way in your contour around this um, uh, pole, right? This contour interval f of z dz is equal to the interval from minus infinity to x naught minus delta, f of x dx, plus uh, the contour, that part uh, of f of z dz in the complex plane, plus, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this is C prime, sorry, C prime over there, plus um, the integral from 
x naught plus delta to infinity of f of x dx, and then plus uh, the interval around the semicircle c of f of c dz. Okay, all of that has to equal 2 pi i times the sum of the residues that are of the poles that are enclosed. Okay, that's just um, the residue theorem. So if we have this case, if we choose to go under and then complete all of that, x naught is enclosed. And uh, we get um, pi, let's see, did I do this right? Yeah, pi uh, i a minus one is in this c prime, right? And two pi i minus a one is in the uh, enclosed residues. And the net from all of this is pi times i times a sub minus one. If we avoid it, oops. Um, we get uh, x not enclosed. So we have that minus pi i to the a minus one, and we still get a net of pi i times a to the sub minus one. It's basically whether what we're adding on the left-hand side of the equation. All of this means that if we let delta go to zero, if we shrink this semicircle down by the pole to zero, then we have in the limit of delta goes to zero of all of this, of the interval of minus infinity to x delta minus, or x naught minus delta of f of x dx plus x naught plus delta infinity f of x dx, where we will identify as p minus infinity to infinity f of x dx. Uh, this is the Cauchy principal value. I think your book, the current version of the book, denotes this as a bar around that. What is A and B? OK. Um, the alternate, an alternate path to this is to uh, move the pole off uh, the uh, contour by delta and then let that delta shrink. Um, I think the best way to, to go about this is to go through two examples, one pretty straightforward and one that's related to your last problem on the homework. Okay, so the main idea here is that if you have uh, a singularity on your contour, you only count half the residue. Um, so let's, as an example, consider um, the integral from zero to five of dx over x minus three. Um, the way we want to break this up then is to uh, consider going from say zero to three and say three to five of dx over x minus three. It's clear that this interval blows up. Not only it blows up, the integram blows up, but we end up with the, the logarithm as our, as our um, value, the log of zero, right? So how do we do this? So th this would be one way to do this, right? So to look at these two pieces. 
So instead, what we're going to do is consider starting from zero to three, have a small detour. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. To R around three. Right? And then this is, so this is three minus R, and this is three plus R, and then this goes to five. So in essence, that's our contour. We're just integrating along uh, the axis there. Um, so now we have an integral from zero to minus three minus r dx over x minus three. And that's equal to the natural log of x minus three evaluated from zero to three minus r. So that's equal to log of r minus log of three. And then we have the interval from three plus r to five of the same thing. And we end up with the log of two minus the log of r. So when we add these two intervals together, we get the log of two minus the log of three equals the log of two thirds. So if r goes to zero, we get the natural log of two thirds. And so what we would say in complex anal analysis is the principal value of this integral dx over x minus three, which your book would also write as the principal value dx over x minus three is equal to log of two thirds. What we've basically done is avoided where this interval uh, blows up. If you think about what this looks like, right? This is our um, three minus r to three plus r region, and we're letting the r shrink to zero. All right. Um, okay, good. Another example. And if I don't get to the quantum mechanical uh, scattering example, I'll post that as a video uh, later today. Um, but one thing that's important for your homework is this integral sine x over x. Your last problem in the homework asks you to um, look at a quantum um, mechanics probability um, that, that's basically one minus cosine of omega t over t, I think. Um, and if you integrate that by parts, you end up with the integral of sine x over x on one side. Um, so what you want to do is look at this and consider that this is going to be the, holy crap, never mind. The imaginary part there of the prince, Cauchy principal value of this interval, e to the i c t c over z. We were just taking that Euler expression for sine and cosine. We know that there is a simple pole we did this, I think, uh, last week. There's a simple pole at z equals zero. And the residue uh, at zero is equal to one. That is, if we take e to the i z over z and expand that, right, we ended up with a term that was one over z, if you remember, right? And so that's the residue. All right. So how do we do this? Well, let's consider the contour minus r to minus little r that skips over the origin. Right, so we'll call this c1, and we'll call this c2. And this is, again, in the x-plane, 
and in the Y plane. And if we perform this interval, we have the contour interval of e to the i z dz over z is equal to each of these parts now. So we have the interval from minus r to little r of e to the i x x dx. We're on the x axis. Okay. Then we have um, the little contour c1. So when we are on these contours and we're lifting ourselves off the real axis, we, we have to use z instead of x, in case that was confusing, um, because I know it was confusing for me too. e to the i z d z over z. Then we add, so we've done this part, we've done this part, now we have to do that part. That's the integral from little r to capital R of e to the i x dx over x. And now we have to do the contour C2, e to the i z dz over z. And because we've, um, well, what's this interval equal to? All right. Well, so we've got our hole right there. So what does the residue theorem tell us? Zero, one, two, pi, e, infinity. Zero. Zero, because the, the pole is not included in the total contour, right? So now um, our job is to take these apart. Um, if we look at this, and that, what are these? If R goes to zero. Principal value. Sam? The principal value, yes, it is the principal value. So this is equal to the principal value, infinity to infinity of e to the i x over x dx. Okay, so uh, we also have from Jordan's lemma that the contour integral C2 or the over that uh, um, upper half plane contour is e to the i z dz over z. That is also equal to zero as r goes to infinity. Right? So if you look, scroll back up to your notes or look at your notes, that was one of the points of this. And so what that means um, is that we have the contour of e to the i z dz over z is equal to this little contour, c1, e to the i z dz over z plus the principal value of e to the i x dx over x, and that has to be equal to zero. Well, the integral of this, which is what we've been, what we were talking about um, essentially in the, just a few minutes ago, is equal to minus pi i times the residue, which is equal to minus pi i. Right? So that means that this is equal to that. But also remember that we were, uh, to solve the original um, question, we were taking the imaginary part of this solution. So the imaginary part then is that the integral, the original integral that we we're interested in, that was um, um, sine of x over x is equal to pi. 
And similarly, you can show that the interval from zero to pi of sine of x over x is equal to pi x. All right, are there uh, any questions about that other than what the hell's going on? So we took what we, what we know about residues inside a contour. We looked at what happens when they're on a contour in order to avoid the contour. We go around them one way or the other. That gives us just pi i. Right? And then uh, that allows us to, to define something called the Cauchy principal value. And that will allow us to, to evaluate integrals like that. Um, there's another integral. Uh, so um, on a video near you, so I'll, I'll do this right after class. Um, you can write um, an integral for quantum mechanical scattering, which looks like minus infinity to infinity of x sine of x dx over x squared minus sigma squared. And ask yourselves, well, what's, what's the value of that? And we're looking at um, <clears throat> the amplitude of um, a scattered wave, right? So I of sigma is basically e to the i sigma for a scattered wave. And what you can see from a problem like this is that you're going to have two poles, right? One at minus sigma and one at plus sigma, right? So that if you uh, try and use something like Jordan's lemma, you would, you're forced to consider a contour that say maybe avoids uh, this contour like this. Now, let me do this the right way. Um, if it's coming, it depends on what direction the wave is coming in. You avoid it on the back end, right? But you can also consider the case where um, it's coming in the other direction, in which case uh, you have um, an integration in the lower half plane. And you need to combine these two cases. And if you're not careful, what you end up with is a standing uh, wave uh, solution. In order to get around that, you have to shift the poles a little bit. So that's the, that's the last uh, little uh, application that I want to use for um, uh, Cauchy principal value and the residue theorem. Um, so I'll do that. It's a, it's a two pages in my notes. Um, and that'll, that'll put a capper on uh, complex analysis for this class. We will see this again. So when we talk about Green's functions, in fact, when we talk about Fourier transforms, we've already set up the notion of how we do uh, Fourier transforms. We're going to need to be able to do all of this. But the bottom line is that with the appropriate choice of contours and the identification of these singularities, we can make all of these integrals uh, into essentially sums. So we have a few, well, maybe a minute or so, if you want to stay longer. Are, do you guys have any questions? Homework is due for like today again? Yeah, but that's flexible. Okay. I mean, what I try to do with the homework too is that I think if you've looked at the homework, um, the homework is not nearly as complicated as what I've been doing in lecture. Um, that's because I just want you to get used to um, using complex variables. So um, there are some identification of poles, there's some roots of, of uh, complex numbers, and then there's just a, a one or two uh, contour integration uh, problems. But they're, they're hopefully you'll find that they're fairly straightforward. Um, if not, I'll be around. Just ping me and, and I can hop on. Okay. Um, so on Wednesday, 
And we will use some of this on Wednesday, but Wednesday we start for a analysis, which should be firm ground for everybody here. Um, and from there, we'll be able to develop uh, tools for solving differential equations. All right? All right, chin up. This is the, the weirdest stuff that we're looking up. Well, not literally chin up, but okay. This is, this is, this is the most opaque, I think. That and Green's functions, but yeah, that's part of this. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. If you're having any trouble with the um, uh, technology or anything else, uh, please let me know. Okay, I'm here to help, but I can't help if I don't know. All right. Okay. I'll see you guys later. Have a great day. Bye, Willow. Bye. Thanks, Mike. Bye.